Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. We've got a very full program. The team's been working hard at putting together the latest information. Uh, we're going to kick things off with an update uh, from, from D.C., talking about a number of different things that are going on in the nation's capital. Then Lisa Simpson is going to take us through a number of uh, technical, update, technical updates uh, that are focused around the tax area. And then we're going to do a deep dive with a practitioner on dealing with the changes uh, related to Section 174. I think you'll find that very interesting. And then we're going to conclude with a tax season discussion around workload management and then close with our open forum. So to kick things off, I'd like to welcome Rachel in the uh, New York studio and Barry Melanson. So it's great, great to see you both. Barry, can you believe it? This is, this is the 93rd uh, town hall, and you and I have been talking about how we're going to be building up to the 100th town hall, which, ju which just coincidentally is going to fall uh, in June at Engage. So that will be exciting. Uh, but Barry, it's great to have you here, and I, and I know you're on the road right now. Eric, it's great to be with you and Rachel and the whole team here. You're right. Can you believe we're going to be at 100? I remember some of our early discussions was about after we were getting through the sort of COVID crisis, you know, would we have all of the breaking news and all the breaking activities that would, uh, that would warrant the continuation of this? Well, the world's a crazy place, and we've proven to have all sorts of breaking activities constantly through this process. Yeah, well, well said, Barry. And actually, I was just with Rachel, and Rachel said, hey, when you started this off three years ago, you were doing this from your homes. That's absolutely <laughs> correct, but it's great to be with you here in our, in our New York office. So we're going to kick things off. Uh, and talk about uh, the 72-minute State of the Union <laughs> address last week. Yeah, if you can believe it, it was just last week. Yeah. And the president, he spoke, as you said, for 72 minutes. We won't go into everything that he talked about during that time, but there were a couple of issues that were of interest to the profession. And the first one is just dealing with non-competes. If anyone watched the State of the Union, you might remember when the president mentioned a cashier working at a burger restaurant, not able to go across the street to have that same job working at a different burger restaurant. And he was referring to non-compete clauses and that he would like to get rid of them. And just a little bit of background on that. Last month, the FTC came out with a very, very broad rule it's over 200 pages. Mm -hmm. And basically what it would do is it would get rid of non-competes. It would make them illegal. And it would also make it so you couldn't maintain an existing non-compete. So that was what the president was referencing when he was talking about um, a cashier working at a burger restaurant. And Barry, I know you're talking to a lot of firms about this matter. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a few layers on this. First off, a lot of people have clients that have non-competes and obviously people in this trusted advisor role that we talk about all the time are very concerned about that. Uh, we do plan to to comment on the proposal. Um, it does have some potential ramifications to the profession, depending on how you structure your firm, what, what form of organization you have, uh, you know, either with employees or with potentially partners or co-owners, let's call it, depending on the on the structure. Um, and, and, and I think, I think the important thing is, you know, the president used it, a, a burger restaurant example, uh, but there is differences between things like burger restaurants and professions where, you know, clientele and business aspects are together, or even businesses that have, um, you know, sort of trade secret type of activities, et cetera. And so, uh, it's a complicated issue. Um, and, you know, like most things that's been coming out of Washington, frankly, if, if something is adopted, Similar to this rule, it's going to be probably challenged in the courts, which will get bogged down from that standpoint. But there are things in here that sort of the typical CPA firm might be concerned about. And we, we're going to be on top of that, and we're going to be working this particular issue. And as most, most things in this area with these proposals, there's a journey that goes uh, through this process. 
Well, the other hot topic of, of uh, one of the other hot topics of the uh, State of the Union was the debt, talking about the debt, and it's, it's something that's being talked about daily. Yes, and that's something that we've talked about on this town hall in the past, and so we won't belabor this issue, but it is something that is significant if we were to default on our <coughs> debt. And so this is something that we're following very closely because of that and the implications that it could have because as these negotiations are going on, some of them could get tied up with the government spending. And as you know, September 30th is the deadline for the fiscal year for the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And there are discussions to move the date to September 30th for the debt limit. Right now, it's as we've said in mm -hmm. the past, it's a moving target. The early indications were that in um, you know last month, they were saying that we could hit what's called X date around June. But yesterday, CBO said that it looks like it could be July or September. And of course, September is around, you know, September 30th is the, the deadline for government funding. Or if they were to change the date legislatively to September 30th, just to give them more time for the negotiations. But also that would help to put pressure on them to come up with some sort of a compromise. So it's something that we're following. Yeah, and Rachel, I think there's two, again, two, two sort of layers here as well. Um, the, the spending tie into this debate begins to, you know, rattle around the issue of services, particularly IRS services and things of that nature, as to what those trade-offs will be and how that might be uh, impacted in that process. Uh, it's an unknown today, and we don't want to belabor it, but it is an unknown. But then there's a second piece of that, um, and, and that is just sort of as, as fiscal professionals, we always worry as professionals, I get this question a lot, just the the overall status of the deficit and how much is too large. And, you know, there's a lot of material out today about showing, um, you know, the debt, the, the spending, the annual deficits, the cumulative deficits compared to G uh, GDP and the like. One of the things I think I just want to remind our members on, and we've talked about it before, we have had for a long time uh, an initiative that we call What's at Stake. And we talk about the deficit in the context, not of the cash deficit, which is what everything is when people talk about it in the media, but rather the accrual basis deficit with all the liabilities, the unfunded mandates and all of those types of things considered. There is an accrual basis governmental consolidated report. Uh, it doesn't generally get done very quickly. In fact, the, the most recent one is a bit late out, but the, the, the uh, sort of a more than a year old report, if you take all of the, the footnote disclosures and unfunded mandates that are not on the balance sheet, on an accrual basis, it's something like 129 trillion deficit. And so I, I, think, I think there is, and, and we carry this message to Congress. Do we carry it to the members of Congress, their staffs? There's not a lot of interest in it, obviously, because everything is on a cash basis. But we all understand as professionals the accrual basis notion um, of these types of things. And we've had a piece of, a, 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 it's not a legislation, but a resolution that's been pending past the House. And it may get wrapped up into this debt extension type of thing. And what that resolution actually calls for is for the Congress to meet and actually receive the audited financial statement of the federal government on the accrual basis so that they sort of have a greater awareness of the overall financial condition of our government. And um, we are big supporters of that because the first step in this process is people just having an awareness, people being members of Congress, having an awareness on what the real financial condition is. Well, Barry, we're going to, in a follow-up town hall, do a overview of the whole What's at Stake initiative. So now let's pivot uh, and talk about a hearing that occurred yesterday, Rachel, uh, the nominee hearing for, for Warfel. Right. So the Senate Finance Committee held the hearing for Danny Warfel to be the next IRS commissioner. And I'm sure he's breathing a sigh of relief mm -hmm. to have that over with. You never want to become the next YouTube star after your confirmation hearing and I didn't find any parts of that hearing in which that he would have that. Um, it went pretty much as expected. Um, both sides made their political points, which is common in these hearings. And they, um, he, he was, you know, he, 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 for himself, I think that he will probably go through the process um, pretty smoothly. 
after this. Um, some of the issues that came up were related to the IRA and the $80 billion for enforcement. And then another issue that came up had to do with taxpayer services. And a lot of senators brought up taxpayer services and the concerns right now that they have with taxpayers not getting the answers that they need or getting the service that the senators would like to see. So that was a big issue. And I think that uh, Danny Warfel heard that message loud and clear. So when do you think this will become final? When will he get confirmed by? So they have until Friday, they have until tomorrow to submit any questions for the record, and then he will have to respond to those. And given the fact that they only gave them a couple of days to submit those questions shows that mm -hmm. they do have some urgency in wanting to get him uh, confirmed. And so my expectation is that they are, we're going on a recess for a week and they'll come back and the finance committee will then hold the committee vote when they return. And then as quickly as possible, they'll have a vote for his uh, confirmation on the full Senate floor. Well, Barry, he was talking about a lot of business principles uh, in running an organization and he's got this, he's got a big task at hand. Well, and clearly the service one that, that Rachel talked about in a lot of the questioning was, is, is, is probably the most critical one. We know this technology, outdated technology issues. Uh, he's worked in the private sector. He's been a you know acting commissioner before, sort of so Rachel's process that she's describing. He's been through that process before. Um, yeah, it you know the service issues are not going to get solved overnight. I do think he has a sensitivity to it based on his responses, and I do think that the Senate and and, and ultimately the House will uh, be very interested in that. And and that's to segue, Eric. That sort of uh, ties into something we're going to talk about here in a moment with a, a letter from Ways and Means. Well, let's 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 go to it. So we've, we've got two kind of hot topics here, the 1099K, which was discussed yesterday, as well as how this $80 billion in funding is going to be used by the IRS. Right. So for the $80 billion in funding, just earlier this month, the new chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, he sent a letter to the acting IRS commissioner related to that $80 billion and looking for a plan on how they plan to spend that money. As you recall, last year, Treasury Secretary Yellen, she asked the IRS to come up with a plan by February 17th. So that's tomorrow. So the Ways and Means Committee Republicans, they want to see that plan. And they have self-described what they are saying is an ongoing, rigorous investigation into the administration and the IRS. So that just gives you kind of a peek into more of what we could see from the Republican majority at the Ways and Means Committee. Yeah, and I think it's important that, you know, that the sort of the gauntlet is being put down and go back to the discussion on the on the debt limits and the funding that September 30th, et cetera. All these things will sort of come together. And um, you know, there's been a lot of questions about the $80 billion and we, we've heard, all, we've discussed it on previous town halls and the like, and there's a lot of noise in the system related to it. And one of the key components, if you recall that we've said is that it, it, the, the $80 billion being spent on enforcement or a good chunk of that being spent on enforcement, uh, is going to have ripple effects throughout every size, uh, taxpayer. And of course, then that brings heat back on the members of Congress. And so that's how all of these things get wrapped together. But it, that will be that will be a, a high profile discussion point. Um, and frankly, you know, the Senate Republican, this, the House Republicans, excuse me, you know, ran on that issue, um, the, the whole IRS issue. Uh, and in fact, it was a piece of legislation that they passed as a standalone piece of legislation that won't become law. But it was one of the first things they actually did. So this is going to be a high profile issue. And then the other issue is related to 1099Ks. As you might recall, um, the American Recovery Plan, it changed the threshold to $600. And at the end of last year, there were considerations to change it back to $20,000. And it all got wrapped up as part of the extenders debate. And so unfortunately, legislation wasn't passed. The AICPA at the time, we were advocating to raise that threshold, but ultimately the IRS ended up extending the current $20,000 for one year. 
And so this is something that we were, are continuing to have conversations with Treasury and with Congress on. Yeah, and I think the key points here are obviously what's taxable is taxable, whether or not there's an information return that comes in with it, right? But the confusion issue here, uh, particularly with this low threshold, uh, is can be just just add to the whole service issues and the confusion issue. Uh, because at a threshold of $600, you're going to have reporting where taxable activities are going to sort of get blended with non-taxable. How is that going to be matched up? How as a preparer are you going to understand basis or as a taxpayer understand basis or how to split those 1099Ks that, um, that might not be there? Now, the other hand is that we know we're living in a digital economy and reporting is becoming more and more connected. So it, it's an interesting sort of evolution here. And, and our position is, is that the confusion on the reporting and, and really in some cases it may cause things to be re ta reported as taxable that actually might not be taxable because of how the reporting system is going forward. Um, and, and frankly, $600 is a pretty low threshold on something like this. And so we've communicated that to Congress and we've, and we've tried to help members of Congress understand that when their taxpayers get sort of caught up into this, when it ultimately gets enacted, it's going to be them that's going to be hearing from their taxpayers. And so we've got this year that we ought to have sort of a, a, a rational debate and discussion about what the right answer might be. And I'd say from a practitioner perspective, this is a topic, if you're having a discussion with your client, you might want to put it on the table with them, depending on what they do and, 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 and whether or not they enter into any of these kind of transactions, because the, the information reporting is probably going to be there in some form in the future. And helping them understand that from a record keeping and a thinking perspective is probably pretty important. That's some great advice, Barry. So I know we've got one other item that we want to cover. This was a big advocacy effort uh, by the AICPA DC team. So last uh, or earlier this week, a letter was sent to the Hill with our compendium, which is a list of over 60 different provisions that we have identified. Mm -hmm that are, they're more technical in nature. Some are just technical corrections and some are more items that we have identified that need to be addressed in the code. These are not, they shouldn't be partisan issues and they should be things that um, would, wouldn't create much controversy. And we've actually, since we sent the compendium to the Hill, we've had a few offices reach out to us who are interested in some of the proposals in the compendium. And I think this is something everybody should know. We do this. This is not the first time we do it. We do it essentially on an annual basis. It, it, it takes a piece of legislation for many of these things to get uh, amended into or be part of to actually get through. It's not going to pass on its own. But these are, you know, we're sort of known for this as a profession, bringing the factual, reasonable implementation of the tax law type of comments forward. And they do generally get traction. And many of them in past years have and actually been enacted. Uh, you can read it. It's a long document, well over 100 pages long. Uh, so it's, it's, it's probably not something you want to be focusing a lot on. But I think it's a w general awareness point of just there are so many inconsistencies of definitions and things of that nature, um, uh, multiple uh, programs that are covering the same thing. And we always try to bring forward some things that actually really focus on the simplification the fair administrability type of aspect of the tax law. Um, that's out there for anyone to read it if they're interested, but the fact of the matter is, it's something, again, if there is any kind of legislation that this can go into that actually moves through the system, there'll probably be a lot of support to clean up some of these things. Well, Barry, Rachel, that was a, a great opening a segment on the town hall. We've got a number of non-compete questions uh, that I'm gonna uh, bring up during open forum. And also, we had some positive comments. Uh, some of the town hall attendees are saying the IRS service levels are getting better. So that's, that, that's good to hear. Well, Danny Wolfer would love to hear that. I can guarantee you. <laughs> well, with that, we now are going to transition uh, to Lisa. And Lisa, welcome. Great to see you. I, I think you're, I don't, I don't think, I know you're in the Durham studio today. So I'll let you. Uh, Take, take us to the next section. Lisa, I think you're muted um, for some reason.
Okay, so we're having some technical difficulties with Lisa's sound. Give us a few seconds here, see if we can resolve that. We could move to the next section and, and bring Chris up, if that makes sense. Hey, welcome, Chris. Chris Wittich. Um, Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I think the topic that we were going to focus on is the 174. Um, so, you know, we know that there's advocacy that is is happening. We know that the AACPA is working on it. I don't know if a fix is going to happen or not, but it's a big issue for our practice. And we wanted to just address a few of these things. Um, as a little bit of history, if you remember the TCJA, this, this was part of that bill, um, but it was five years ago. And I know when I read TCJA, I wasn't really concerned about this. Uh, you know, you read it and you say, oh, this is a problem for 2022, Chris. Um, and now it's 2023 and it's a, it's a problem we got to deal with. So what it's really looking at in one section, section 174 is looking at those research and experimental costs, that R and D, and you're going to have to capitalize it for these 22 tax returns. And so when we say capitalize, we're talking about, you're going to get a five year straight line amortization. So half in the first year, half in the sixth year and sort of evenly spread in between. And that's gonna be a big, big impact for some clients. I know not every client uh, of ours has R&D costs, but for the ones that do, or for the ones that have work similar and they're doing research and experimentation, um, it's a big, big issue. And so this is really focused on the people with R&D credits. Uh, I know there's a great, great article there in the tax advisor. Um, it gives a pretty good overview of what the issues are. We don't have all of the answers necessarily, but it's a pretty good uh, overview in that article. Hey, so what did I miss? <laughs> Welcome we back, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, Eric. I'm sure you uh, rattled off all the provisions of 174 with ease, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And what we did, Lisa, we'll go back to your technical update section and let's give and give Chris a, a, a proper we jumped right into this proper introduction. So as Eric likes to say, it's a live show. All right. So let's let's go back and, and uh, take a deep breath and get Chris formally introduced, as Eric said. Um, Chris Wittick is a partner with Boyum and Boyum and Berenscher, and um, he is also a very active volunteer with the AICPA, especially in our tax um, volunteer opportunities. So he's a member of our tax executive committee, which is doing a lot of great work, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And also a couple of task forces around um, tax resiliency that you've heard me talk about on previous town halls, and also um, tax filing. I've forgotten the formal name because I'm a little out of sorts there. Um, filing flexibility task force. So, um, Chris, did you get a second to talk about your firm and kind of what you do in the firm? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, we're a firm in Minneapolis, um, roughly 130 people or so, and I work in the business advisory services. Um, you know, certainly the one of the hot topics we've been dealing with, and even in a partner meeting just today, we're sort of finalizing what the plan is for 174 and the clients that have it um, because it's, it's, you know, one of the sort of two big hot topic uh, yeah. things for this year. Did you address the hot topic of whether or not it's R and E or R and D? <laughs> we got to get that covered. We didn't uh, dive into it too far, but I'll probably call it R and D. Uh, but if you read it in the code, it'll be R and E. Yeah. So we're, we're just going to agree that we're going to call it R and D and it's gonna be R and E, so no confusion at all. All right, so I think you were able to cover um, what's new and how we got here. 
And so as you are thinking about how you're handling this with your clients, we've got some, some questions that you and I kind of worked through um, in, in our previous conversation. And a lot of these come from a, a conversation that you had with some, some of your peer group. So it's 174 um, question time. What are you thinking about in terms of how you're addressing this with your clients? Yeah, so I would say for most of them, hopefully we've done the planning and we've been talking to them about it. I know there's always a few, uh, the smaller ones that fall through the cracks. So we're talking to them now about it as we start working on it. And we're just explaining to them, hey, this is the current law. You need to add back these Section 174 costs. Most clients then say, what is the Section 174 cost? You know, we've been clients for... 10 years, you've never once mentioned this code section before. So we give a little of the history and have to talk through, you know, it's some of the costs related to research and it's similar to the R and D credit, but it's not quite the same. And so when we're talking with clients, we're looking at estimating, you know, just how big of a deal is this for each client? You know, we got some clients where almost 100% of their wages, almost 100% of their activity is R&D type of activity. Well, it's gonna make a huge, 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 huge difference for them. And we got other clients where, all right, they maybe have two people that are doing some R&D some of the time, it's not a super material issue for them. So it's very different. We have other clients, this doesn't apply to them whatsoever. So it's quite a variation and we're just trying to sort of identify which are the ones that are going to have a big issue, make sure we go through those and sort of do it in order of, you know, the, the ones that have the biggest issue with this topic, but it's a very challenging area because there's still a lot that we don't know. We have some idea how to calculate some of these things, but you know, we're not, there's not a lot of regulations available. I know we've talked to some clients and it's like, well, okay, we need to figure out what your 174 costs are. The next question is always like, well, what happens if three months from now it gets fixed? Why would we figure this out now? So I think a big thing for us is figuring out which clients really need to deal with it now, where it's really material and you know, I think most of the time we're going to punt this to later, uh, whenever possible. We're going to do the detailed calculations later. Um, we're going to really deal with it, you know, in the summer. It's only kicking the can down the road a little bit. But for now, can we get by with an estimate when we're thinking about extending the returns? And I know I, I came back in as you were mentioning that Journal of Accountancy article. So I'll call that out again as, as a great resource. And it highlights the fact that there is still a lot of guidance needed. There is clarity needed around what is a Section 174 cost. Um, so you've, you've got to figure out, is it worth it to the client for you to go ahead and start um, trying to figure out what those are or, or wait, like you said. So you're, my understanding, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're trying to get your clients to extend to see what happens with the, any possible legislative change and also to allow you to do that deep dive. So you're, you're giving them a, a couple of different estimates that they might want to make when they extend? Yeah, I mean, we just this week I went through in great detail with a client because they're engineers and they like to understand this stuff. And we're laying out, hey, this is the scenario. If we file your return now, we have to do a deep dive of this calculation. And, you know, we're going to charge you separately to do that. And then you are going to file your return and you're going to include all of these costs and you're going to pay all of the tax. If there is a change, a couple of months from now, so let's think through what does that mean? Well, that means, you know, maybe we spent the time and the cost to do the deep dive 
and it's not really worth anything, but we've already committed to it. And then we're going to have to amend your return. And they're like, well, we don't, we don't love that. And then we're going to think about the state implications of, you know, does the federal change get through to the state return? And then what are we going to need to do on the state side of things? And it gets to be messy. And so their choice is we can do the deep dive now. We can pay the tax now. And then we can deal with maybe having a mess later. Or we can file the extension. We can use an estimate, you know, a reasonable estimate of their 174 costs. And then this summer, we can finalize their return. If it is fixed, we won't have the extra cost. If it is fixed, um, we'll have a lot more certainty. And then we won't have to deal with the amended return. And we won't have to deal with that. So I'm encouraging people to extend. And I think the vast majority of our clients are going to do that. You know, there's always a few that for whatever reason, they really don't want to extend. Um, and that's fine. The, you know, we'll probably file a few, but when you go through and explain to them, Hey, we got to figure this out, but it might be moot in a couple of points. And then we got to go fix it again. Um, I think the extensions have gone, um, very well for clients. And I think for us, we're just trying to document that, okay, if we're going to do the extension, that's great. Here's an estimate of how much you're going to owe with the 174. Here is the estimate of what you're going to owe if 174 is fixed. And then, you know, the rubber meets the road. How much do you want to pay? with the extension. It's the client's choice and we need to document their response. I know I have some clients that will pay the tax with the extension. And I know I have other clients who absolutely are not going to pay the tax, but they're okay with the penalties and they're okay with the interest if it doesn't get fixed. You know, just different clients have, have different mindsets on that. And so really trying to document it was their choice. We help them make an informed decision, but then we're going to document, hey, this is what they selected to do with that extension. And that's a, a perfect tie-in to um, some of the, the tips from peers that, that we had from our call. And it is important to remember, it is the client's decision. You inform them, they make their decision, and then document their decision. So great points there. Um, some of the other tips that were passed along on that February 9th conversation that you all have access to um, are, are listed here. So I, I like the one, we talked a little bit earlier about um, kind of looking at who's gonna have the most potential impact. And we've talked about, you know, how do, how's your client gonna feel about having some risk related to an underpayment? But we also talked a little bit about opportunity. So what are your thoughts on how, how to frame this as a positive? Yeah, I mean, I think the R&D credit is very similar to 174. And if you haven't, you know, if for whatever reason the R&D credit wasn't a great fit, um, because you're looking at it and you're saying, hey, this is a lot of work, the credit's not gonna be quite enough to really make it worthwhile, I think it's a great opportunity to go back and revisit the R&D credit. If you're looking at 174 anyways, um, I think doing that deeper dive on the R&D credit, which is all sort of inside of the 174 bucket, so that you're making sure you're capturing the credit, because the credit can still help you. The credit hasn't you know, gone away. The credit is still there. And with the potential to have this add back of income, I think it can change the calculus a little bit on whether or not the R&D credit is worth pursuing. So they're very similar topics. And I think it's a great time to take a look at both of them because there is so much overlap. And the R&D credit is a benefit for the clients. 
I know the 174 topic with clients is not always the, the most fun thing to discuss because they're going to owe tax at the end of it. I know I prefer doing my advisory work on, you know, and my tax planning on the things where they, I can help the client. Uh, and so I love mixing in that R and D and just making sure we're, we're capturing everything there is on that side. So um, I, I know that on the February 9th call, there were some conversations around, please don't shoot the messenger. You're just the messenger. Yeah. Um, how are you approaching your conversations with clients about this is additional work? This is outside the scope yeah. of your typical tax return preparation. So give me a little bit of insight into how you're having those conversations. I mean, I think that's that's part of that discussion around extensions is, you know, maybe we did some tax planning and we discussed it and that was probably part of the tax planning, you know, bill. But when it gets to time to do the return, if we're going to have to do this 174 analysis and we're going to have to go through and look at these costs, that's something we've never done before for clients and we intend to bill them separately and additionally for that. And I think, you know, some clients are very fee sensitive and they really like, or they're not excited by paying for that with a possibility that, you know, three months from now, it was a total waste of time because they fix it. And so it's, it's helped push a few more people into saying, you know, an extension is probably the best way to get real clarity by the time we file this return. Um, because we're doing extra work. It's really complicated. We don't have all of the answers. We're just doing the best we can do to figure out these costs. But that's not just part of the normal tax return cost that we built into, you know, when we gave you a price quote for the tax return. So we're going to sort of separately line item that whenever possible. That sounds like a great approach. Um, I'm going to propose that we um, skip our technical update. There were a few slides in the earlier part of the session. You've got great links there, nothing earth shattering that we have to dive into because I really want to take a, um, more time to focus on some of the practice management tips that we're going to get to in just a bit. Um, but before we move away from section 174, I do want to um, encourage you to take a look at the letter that's been uploaded to the resource section today, because um, as they say, I, I think you'll feel like you've been seen. If you read this letter, um, I'm pretty sure you're going to be identifying with a lot of the, um, the issues that our advocacy team has brought forward, but specifically around 174. Um, in a letter that was just sent to um, Congress on the 14th, we've asked Congress to extend the effective date of this new um, Section 174 treatment and delay it until um, tax years beginning after December 31, 2025. So a four-year delay to allow for simplicity, to allow for that guidance that, that Chris talked about that we that we need to be able to accurately implement the, um, the le legislation. But let's put that delay out there so that we can minimize the confusion and, um, and move forward in a, in a proactive way. So you may be saying, I want more than a four-year delay. We get it. Um, so we've also recommended that um, Congress look at a permanent extension of that. But again, read that letter because within there, they're talking about the impact of extenders from um, 2021, 22 that are, are being um, let to lapse in the uncertainty that that's creating from a tax planning, from a cash flow planning, from a business planning standpoint. So um, just a, a plug to our advocacy team for the great work they've done there. And if we switch over, um, I've got one other slide for you on um, just some, oh, never mind, I'm, I'm out of order. Let's, um, let's stick with um, tax season workload management because, Chris, I think you've got some, some great tips that um, you wanted to, to share with our audience today. And I, I put them into two main buckets. It's managing client expectations. And we've talked a lot about that in the past, but um, Chris, you've got some good approaches there. And then managing the volume. So um, I'll, I'll let you kind of dig into the topic that you want to pick first. 
Well, yeah, let's start with the uh, client expectations. And the uh, I think there will be a link, but there were some great sessions on this in the fall, late in the fall, where we talked about some specifics here, but it's really about communicating with clients. And one of the goals that I have is that the information needs to be in the door four weeks before the deadline. And if it's not, they're getting an extension. And so if I think about March 15th, uh, four weeks before that is right about now. So the deadline is really like tomorrow and you know maybe I'll let it slide till Monday, but I'm doing a ton of extensions right now for March 15th due dates. Um, same thing with the individuals. Obviously, there's always going to be, you know, the exceptions to the rule. That's fine. But one of the focuses is really, can I get some of the low hanging fruit extended and not wait until March 13th, March 14th, and then we're running around trying to do a ton of extensions. So in the fall, we were very clear with people in January, we're following up, we're telling them, hey, these are the deadlines. And if you want to, you know, get an extension now, we can definitely do that. Um, but if you're going to get your uh, return done on time or during tax season, I should say, then these are the terms, you know, we've got to get your stuff in the door. Um, as it relates to the volume, I know we've done a good job of sort of looking at our, our client list, especially those individuals, especially just any clients that, that want our time only during tax season and not the rest of the year. Um, some of those, you know, maybe aren't a great fit, but trying to extend them. If we did tax planning, like I don't really need to redo the whole return if we did tax planning in December. So we can use that tax planning, we can do their extension and get that stuff sort of out of the way a little bit quicker because you know, it's all about the client expectations and meeting what you told them you were gonna do. And then if we can cut down on the volume a little bit and we can move that volume just a little bit up sooner into tax season, uh, I think it's, it's really gonna help at the end of tax season, is really gonna help our administrative staff who are the ones you know trying to e-file all these extensions and trying to get everything done in, the, in just at the last minute. And I think if we asked for a show of hands of our attendees, um, how many of you know who you're already going to extend? There will be a lot of hands up in the air. So we do know that there's some, some opportunities for efficiency there. Chris, when, when you and I were talking, you framed this as you're trying to get to a new normal. You want to give us a little bit of insight into that, and sure. then we'll talk about how the, um, filing task, the easy filing task force is working into that. So for me, uh, I know 2020 was a hard year for all of us. 2021, you know, worked a ton. And I promised myself, I promised my wife, uh, I promised us that the family that I would not work that much. So my goal is 1800 total hours uh, for the year, billable, non billable vacation, everything. Uh, I was a little bit over that in 2022. Uh, but not too bad. I still cut more than a thousand hours out of my work life. And so that's the driving factor for me. I will definitely hit it in 2023. But when I, if I look at it through that lens of this is how much I'm willing to work, it's 1800 hours. So can I be spending that time working on the smallest individual returns and chasing around to get their organizer? Or can I delegate that to staff people, some of it to admin people? And so it's been the driving force behind sort of how I delegate and those client communications. Certainly there are some A clients or the big clients or the complicated clients or whatever, where I'm doing exactly the same thing I did the year before or the year before that. But I've prioritized my time and it's really led to some great opportunities for other managers and staff people in the firm to take over a portion of that work. 
they're not, you know, signing the tax return, but they're taking over a portion of that work. They're helping facilitate and they're learning and they're getting to know these clients better. And I think it's been a good experience for them. And it's really been necessary for me to reduce the hours so that I'm just focused on the key things where I can deliver a ton of value. And I want to focus on, on just those items as much as I can. So to the point about delivering a ton of value, um, Barry, I think you were going to talk a little bit about the, the filing flexibility task force and some of the work it's been doing. Yeah, the, uh, Chris, thank you for those great suggestions. And one of the, you know, as, as I travel a lot and interact with our members, the two things about the tax season issues and how to, how to manage, and Chris had some great practical solutions. The two that I hear the most common is the issue of why does the extension process have to be so complicated and can't we find a better way to do that? And that actually is a big theme of this slide that Chris walked through. The other, of course, is, is, the, is the overlapping time frame of the K-1s and the extended, and the extended due late that, that comes at. We'll talk about that one another time, but let's just talk about the extension issue. We've had a task force that has been working uh, on this particular issue, and I'm a big proponent of the things that are being talked about. And, and frankly, it would take legislation um, and, and more to come on this. But the basic concept is, if you think about it from a tax practice perspective, you have staff or yourself that's working on these issues to basically get a rough estimate or a, a quasi calculation of the, of the individual tax return to get that extension. It's an automatic extension, but the tax liability issue is a big issue. We all know about safe harbors when we talk about underpayment penalties from the prior year tax. Why can't we have some kind of simpler process that includes a safe harbor? Obviously, the government wants the cash flow, wants the taxes paid. But is there a different way to think about a safe harbor in that process so that it literally would be an automatic extension? You could talk to your client about a safe harbor based on the prior year taxes, not maybe equal to prior year taxes, some factor of that. Um, and because the reality is, is that staff makes a calculation or the partner makes a calculation, then they put that file down and then they pick it back up months later. And, they, and all that knowledge that was there has to pretty much be redone. It's an inefficient process. It's a, it's a time and billing process as it relates to the client or the firm, you know, having an impact on that time. And so the task force is, some, some very, uh, is working on some very significant recommendations in this part. We anticipate that the recommendations, which will, you know, when, when they're done, we'll, we'll share them in, in, in multiple different venues. We anticipate it taking legislation, but we anticipate it to be a pretty significant part of our proactive legislative agenda. Um, again, most things like this won't pass as a standalone. But it is something that if we can get momentum behind it once we finalize it, then it is something that can be built into some other piece of tax code section um, uh, legislation that might be going through the system. And it's got to balance the cash payments with the ease of being able to deal with the issue. And, and so we're pretty excited about some of the work that's being done in that space. Well, Lisa and Chris and Barry, we got a lot of questions coming in. Um, we're getting, we're going to be going into open forum in a second, but just let me, you know, one, one to, to Lisa, you and Chris, just they really appreciated all the, the strategy around doing the extension. But there's a few comments coming in on whether you can extend without client consent. Well, yeah, no, I think you get the client consent. You know, you've, you're talking to the client. You're not just... Uh, you know, willy nilly filing extensions for everyone. Um, but you're, you're telling them up front and then you're communicating with them. Hey, we're going to file the extension. Is that okay? You know, clients are, w once you've set the expectation with them up front, I found, and then you present to them, Hey, you know, we didn't get the information. We're going to do the extension. Is that okay? Or, you know, the payments we're going to suggest based on the tax planning. And uh, I, I think they're pretty, pretty amenable to that usually. And Chris, do you have language in your engagement letters that says you'll automatically extend every return? Uh, because I know some firms are moving toward that. No, I, I, we haven't gone that far. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I think the engagement letter says something in there, at least the individual one about, you know, hey, this is the date we really need your information back by, but it hasn't yeah. gone, you know, quite to the extent of, hey, we're going to file an extension in January for everyone. No. And putting on my risk management hat really quickly, um, it, it is it is a risky behavior to extend clients that haven't returned a signed engagement letter, you can't just assume that they're your client and file an extension on their behalf. So we had a conversation with our um, Aon and CNA folks a while ago on that. So just a, a quick reminder, um, they have to be your client before you extend the return. So Lisa, I want to move us to open forum in a second, but one, one last question here for Chris. Chris, everyone likes your, everybody likes your 18 1800 hour goal. The question is, um, do you let staff also have that goal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's not without a cut in pay. I mean, when we have a couple of managers, um, a couple of staff people, I think are thinking about it, but yeah, they're at 75% or 50%. Um, you know, they're not, they're not making as much as the manager that is at a hundred percent time. Um, and I understand that I'm going to make less money because I'm working less hours. Um, so it's, it's a trade-off, uh, but it's, it's one that I'm excited to make and it's, it's been good for me. Hey, Chris, what's the reaction of the staff on the pay cut? Does that, that does, does that ultimately come back to the, to the, you know, a different answer or what kind of reaction are you getting from the different generations? I think for the most part, the people considering that part-time are doing it for family reasons. They're doing it for time. And, you know, they understand if they're at, you know, 75% FTE, their salary is going to be 75% of what it was before. Um, and so they, they understand that. I mean, it makes, it makes sense to them but they've really appreciated, hey, I can, you know, I can be 75%. I got young kids at home and, you know, that's, that's what I want to do. And I think offering that flexibility is great for us um, because if, if you say, no, it's got to be 100% or nothing, there's some people that are going to leave and they're going to find a job, you know, at another firm probably that lets them do 75% or 50% or wherever they're at. Well, thanks. We're, well, this is a topic to continue on a future town hall. So Lisa, just any comments here on these uh, yeah. additional Super quick. Goals? Yeah, super quick. Um, April Walker has, has been leading a reimagining your tax, tax practice series. I've talked about it before, but I want to make sure you know that all of those um, webcasts are out there for you to access for free, you're going to get amazing insights from your peer group around. Uh, my favorite is how to get to tax season zen. So check that one out. Well, let's now move into open forum. Bring Rachel back. Lots of lots of questions about everything that we we covered today. Barry, I'm going to start out with you. A uh, question about the FTC ruling and the non competes related to how you see it potentially impacting mergers and acquisitions, obviously, if it if it stays intact? Well, I think it has a value impact on a merger and acquisition if if people can leave shortly thereafter and truly be in competition with sort of the entity with the entity they just sold their practice to. Uh, I think it, I think that clearly is a standard uh, process that's been in place um, in any of these types of transactions. And, and that's just one example of how it affects um, it affects the profession um and you know you can you can see it as it's a lot of firms deal with it as it relates to staff that reach a certain level and it doesn't even have to have an m a transaction yes but i think it will have a value add impact well, a lot of questions related to that related to um what does this mean what does this mean for all the contracts that are in place right now uh with uh you know at firms with with partners and if if they if they leave, can they can they take go out go take the clients with them? And what are all the ramifications well, so that you it, just that was broad the M and A thing, but this is just yeah, in a firm it, right now. And what does it mean for my contracts? In in the in the purest well, first off, 
we don't know exactly what's going to be adopted. So I, I, I don't think people should overreact from the standpoint of implications of current contracts, et cetera. Let's see how it plays out. There's a comment period. As I said, that there'll probably be litigation that'll come to it. There's probably going to be modification. There's going to be a lot of people making the point that professions need to be looked at differently than sort of a trade or an employment situation like the example that the president used in the State of the Union. Um, so there's going to be a lot of give and take and discussion that comes along that way. It's none of these none of these regulations typically get adopted exactly like they're proposed in the comment period. We are going to be commenting and making the points about the ramifications of the unintended consequences. Um, the reality is, in its purest sense, the way that it has been talked about, you would have implications to someone being able to leave and, and in effect, compete with you as it relates to the clients that they may take with you that may be prohibited under rules that you may have today or contracts that you may have today. Now, well, existing contracts have, an, have an, a, you know, a retroactive uh, implication or not, I think that is to be determined based on what comes out of an ultimate rule. Okay. Well, Lee, so we got a couple, a couple of items that you and I and Barry want to review as we, as we close out here. So the final question, Barry, you are, uh, Rachel, just likelihood of the section 175 getting getting you know reverted back pushed out extended you know how, how do you see that and just quick, quick quick answer on that i think that there's tremendous bipartisan support for it hmm. it's whether or not it gets tangled up in other issues like it did the end of last congress but i think that given the support for it as long as there is a bill that it can be attached to um it it could happen this year Okay, so stay tuned. We'll we'll keep you updated every every two weeks, Barry. Did, well, it's yeah. one seventy four, not one seventy five. You just made all the tax practitioners nervous, Eric. <laughs> so, I, I, uh, <laughs> but but uh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. I would say very low prob. I agree with Rachel. Very low probability is standalone. It's really about is there something that gets compromised in this polarized Congress that can move through that contains it. That's really where the odds of passage change. Well, thanks. So thanks, Chris, uh, for being with us today. What we have now here, you're, we have a couple of polls that we that we want to walk you through here. And this information we're going to share with you via the newsletter in our next town hall. So this first question is related to tax season, and you should be seeing it right now. Um, we we want to know what your top challenge this tax season is. So it's live. I'm going to give you Lisa. We're going to give them about you know 20 seconds to uh, to respond to this. Yep. And, and while they're doing that, I, I just want to remind everyone we've gotten some questions in about how do I get to those um, tax season Zen recordings and the 174 recording. Please make sure that you download the slides from today's resources because those will give you the links that you need. If not, you can um, just search that in the AICPA site. So we can now, I think, move to the next polling question. We just want to get a good indication of, uh, you know, areas of, 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 of work here. If you're in a firm, business and industry, uh, government or ed education. So that, that poll question should be coming up right now. There it is. So Barry, as, as they're answering this, just just a lot of dialogue, a lot of lot of interest on on the non compete there, and just trying to figure it out. So I think those comments that, that you just made are going to be very helpful for people well, just to give this time and watch the process. Uh, like we did with with uh, with Chris today on one seventy four. I think in a in a in the near term we can do a a 10 or 15 minute segment just on the details related to it, uh, what's in it and what the, you know, how it's going to probably move from this point forward. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for the responses to the type of organization. And now just one final poll and then we'll wrap this town hall up. Just would like to know the, the size of your organization. 
So this is great. Another another town hall, Lisa, number 93 here. And uh, we're, what we're going to be doing over the next uh, three town halls is be a lot of tax topics, but we also will be talking about, you know, broader strategy. And, and as we move into May, uh, we've got some very interesting guests that we're going to be inviting to our town halls as we move to our 100th edition. Looking forward to it. So now just real quickly, um, we can kind of cover this slide here. Um, the, the, um, the, poll, the final polling slide should be coming down. Okay, well, thank you for being with us today. Uh, it was be great being with you, and we look forward to being back with you on March 2nd, and Ed Carl is going to be with us on March 2nd, and then we've got uh, another town hall on March 23rd with Carl Peterson and others, and Barry, you'll be back with us on April 6th. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.